All right, here's another early integrated circuit. And as promised, we're going to do some more early transistor arrays today. And the one we're going to look at today is um, not one that was made in the former Eastern Bloc, but this one is an American CA3046. And I have two of them here. This one is made by RCA. <clears throat> And is from the looks of it obviously older. And this one is a bit of a newer one made by Intersil. Um, the CA3046, I think it came out in the early 70s, but it had an incredibly long life. I think um, they're not making it anymore, but I think production stopped in 2010 or something. So that chip had a very, very long life for what it is. So let's look at the containing transistors in the datasheet. So how is this thing um, structured? I'll just have to zoom in here. So I think the top part of the datasheet is not that that interesting general purpose NPN transistor array. Okay, yeah, we guessed so much. Um, the real difference between this one and the earlier ones um, we were looking at the MAA245 and friends is that this one is um, fairly non application specific. The MAA245, it sort of had the transistors arranged in an amplification chain. And it was, you were really fairly constrained in what you could do with that because you had the transistors, at least two of them, in um, all of the chips. You had them coupled together and you also had some resistors on there um, that um, would constrain you quite a bit. This one, and I think this is why it was um, very successful, uh, doesn't have that. It just has single transistors here, and then it has one differential pair over here, which is helpfully labeled differential pair. Um, and you can do some really cool things with that because you, you just have single transistors in here. But then you ask yourself, uh, why wouldn't I just use five transistors? Um, why do I have to buy this chip? A um, couple reasons for that. First one is um, it's high. It's more integration, really. Um, it's probably easier to just place one of these chips than buy um, five single transistors. Place five transistors. Um, yeah, but there is a couple more reasons and a couple more good reasons. One of them is these chips are all on the same die, uh, the transistors, they're all on the same die. So um, not only are they going to be very similar to each other, because overall the die is going to have the same composition um, everywhere. I mean, it's going to match, over, on average, it's going to match closer between two of those than two transistors from a different lot. Um, that you just buy like that. And the other one is, these are all on the same die, so they're all firmly coupled to each other. And that is uh, fairly important in many different applications. And just have a quick demo here to um, explore that. Right, so here we have a random NPN transistor from my bin of parts. And it has its base connected to a resistor, which is hooked up to a power supply. And the emitter is hooked up to ground. And then we're measuring the base emitter voltage here. So it's at 6.35 at the moment, which is fairly normal for silicon transistors and this one in particular. So let's see what happens if I dip this into this beaker of a relatively hot non-conductive liquid. So if I dip this in here. Okay. 
you can see that this voltage is actually quite dependent on the so temperature of the transistor. So why is this a problem? And well, if you cool it down, in many applications you same, actually uh, want to have your base emitter voltage relatively constant. Um, one of them I can think of is a simple transistor current source, which I have a schematic of that directly from Wikipedia right here. And if you look at that, there's actually, in this one, it's actually a diode here that compensates for the voltage drop through here. And what you'd normally do is you'd actually firmly bond this diode to this transistor here because you want them heating up and cooling down at the same time. The <clears throat> real issue here is that if you look at our schematic here again, your transistors, they're not only going to um, heat up and cool down with the ambient temperature, they might be um, heating up or cooling down because they're actually dissipating power. So, especially for this differential pair here, if you look at that, it's um, fairly reasonable to assume that you might actually dissipate 10% more power in this one. And if you don't firmly bind them together or have them on the same die as here, um, you get, you're going to get an imbalance. And this is um, a thing that you can solve by having these firmly bounded together on the die level. Another cool thing that you could do is if you wanted to have your differential pair not only... Um, firmly bonded to each other, but you'd also want to have it at a specific temperature. Yeah, you could do that with this chip. <clears throat> it actually has been done before. You could use one of these transistors here, and you could measure the base emitter voltage, like we've done in our demo, and then you could um, sense temperature because this uh, voltage is dependent on temperature. And you could use another transistor on the same die, like this one down here. And you could just put some current through it and therefore heat up the die. And if you put a control loop in between here, you could actually regulate the temperature that the die inside of this thing has. And therefore you could get a... Uh, differential amplifier that is not only firmly compensated but also um, at the same temperature, which is pretty cool. Um, one thing that you have to uh, think about if you're using this chip is this one, Q5 up here, is bonded to the substrate or the they're all bonded to the substrate. Um, the emitter here is actually connected to the substrate. So this pin 13 here should be connected to the lowest point, the uh, one with the most negative potential in the circuit. All right, so what can we do with our five matched, thermally connected transistors in this package? Um, a couple of cool things. They have been very, very popular in the uh, synthesizer community and it's not all that unlikely that you you may have never used one of these before but um, you probably have heard one before they were in a lot of um, transistor era analog synthesizers this is the schematic of the Moog um, what's it called can't remember what it's called, but anyway, if you look down here, uh, it's not the best scan in the world, but these are our differential pairs out of our CA3046 here. And they actually, they also use the other transistor. Here's another one. 
it's another differential pair. And then in a couple more places in the circuit, there are transistors that are actually out of that package. Um, can't find one at the moment, but earlier I saw one. I don't really look. Oh, there, there's, there's another one. So um, these have found applications in synthesizers and uh, these sort of things. Although you couldn't only use them in the audio range, you could go up to 120 megahertz, which is quite a lot. All right, so that's where I think I'm going to leave it for now. No um, cool circuit with this yet. I'm still thinking about something, but um, I'm quite busy at the moment with moving and all. And um, I'll still think about it, and I'll probably have a cool um, follow-up video to this um, using these chips, because you can actually do quite a lot of things with these. So, as always, uh, thank you very much for watching, and I'd really like to see you on the next one.